Okay, we are going to give it just a few minutes for everything to the audience to come in. And to get started, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, um, well, we'll go ahead and slowly get started. Um, you are here today for another C2C Care webinar. Um, this one is on the state of mental health for workers at cultural heritage institutions. We're gonna be running from about 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern, um, and we are recording today's program. Um, I'm also just gonna go through a couple of quick introductory slides, then we're gonna jump in right into today's program because we have quite a lot to go over for today. So my name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator. I'm located um, just outside of Washington, D.C. in Silver Spring, Maryland, and I'm very excited to have you all here. Just a quick reminder of our program in case you've never joined us before. Um, this is our home on the web, connectingtocollections.org. On that website, you will find an archive of our entire program. Uh, C2C Care has been around for over 10 years, so there's quite the archive of programs um, that you can actually access for webinars and courses. So I encourage you to do some digging on that website. Um, another really nice feature of our website is the community link. Um, we actually have a fabulous community set up where people can go in and ask direct questions for um, basically collections care. And we have a fabulous group of volunteer experts who will then go out and find a good answer for your question. So if you have a question about anything related to your collections, I encourage you to go take a look at it. We do have two homes on social media as well, where we publish announcements and information about our program. Uh, one is on Facebook and the other one is on the network formerly known as Twitter. Both have the handle at C2C Care. So I encourage you to follow both of those if you are interested in them. A uh, quick couple of really quick technical reminders for today. Um, we are using Zoom webinars, so you are able to actually interact with the hosts by two means. One is via the chat, the other is via the Q&A box. Um, the chat is a really good place to just say maybe hello, say where you're located from. That's always fun to say. Um, you can also, see the, also say something about the weather. People always like to talk about the weather in there. Um, and if you're having any technical issues, please go ahead and reach out to me via the chat. We've also enabled the Q&A box for this session. Um, the Q&A box is really a good spot to ask us questions when it comes to the panelists. Um, I really encourage people to put their questions in that Q&A box because it allows us to track the questions throughout the program. So please do use that if you can. Just a quick uh, programming note for upcoming programs for CUC Care. We do offer one free webinar a month. Um, and in November, we have a twofer. We actually have two webinars planned for that month. One is on November 14th, which is Keeping the Groove, Caring for Grooved Audio Media, where we'll be talking to someone from the Smithsonian Folklife Program just about the care of this kind of particular object. In November 19th, we'll be talking to some specialists about contamination and pesticide residues for small and mid-sized cultural institutions. Um, that one's actually kind of a preview of a course that we're gonna be planning for early 2025, dealing with uh, contaminants and tribal collections. So I would encourage you to go check that out as well. And then in January, we have care of newspaper clippings. So um, if you have that kind of collection item within your you know, collection, that might be a good uh, webinar for you to sign up for as well. We have someone from NARA coming to talk to us about that. So again, please do register for those free programs if you are able to. So we have four speakers today who are gonna talk to us about this topic. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and introduce our, introduce our first speaker for today. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Stephanie N. Arell from Fordham University. Um, and Stephanie, you can take over whenever you're ready to start the presentation. Great, thank you. Hi, everybody. And thank you to Robin for inviting me to do this and to Stephanie Black, who was a major force behind um, some of the research that I'm gonna share with you today. I'm gonna start with, um, introducing you to some of the work that I've done around the question about the psychological, ethical, physiological costs of inter uh, exchange with material or people that would be characterized as traumatic. Uh, this is the, am I playing this? Let me play this for you. Okay, so this is the the text that I wrote, Bearing Witness, The Wounds of trauma of Mass Trauma at Memo 
Memorial Museums, and it was published in September of uh, 23. Now, I, I know the audience that I'm speaking to doesn't necessarily obviously confront uh, artifacts related to mass trauma, but I want to introduce the possibility that there are various dimensions, which you probably recognize or know, of what it means to say something is traumatic. And when I'm saying that, I'm specifically thinking about the ethical effects, even, even if you're addressing things related to climate change, like I just heard in the introduction, if you're talking about the environment, there's something ethical, there's something psychological, there's something emotional that emerges in our confrontation, collection of, exhibition of things that have any kind of legs or tie to something that that if, that has an effective urge or a surge for our bodies. And very often, not always, but very often, um, maybe in about 60% of the population, which is in a small number, there's gonna be something that attaches to a traumatic event, a traumatic history, or even traumatic um, events that aren't personally, um, personally strong in any particular way. So the book itself looked directly at memorial museums across the globe. I did over 82 interviews. You can see the numbers there of, of who, who was constituted in those interviews, um, how many countries that I went to, and the staff members that I interviewed. Staff members were uh, completely varied either attached the event or unattached. And I usually, when I give this presentation, talk about some of the extreme examples like survivors that are working in the field. But I think it might be worth just offering one quick example of somebody that I interviewed who had no connection to the event that she was commemorating. And this was specifically at the 9-11 Memorial Museum in New York. And she, as she was documenting um, these photos of survivors, she told me that there was always one a month that stood out to her that she felt a connection to that she also felt haunted her in some way. Again, no connection to the event. It was just the act of dealing with a photo and a story of a victim that elicited in her um, a, a pretty deep psychological connection and then subsequent response. You can see the questions that I asked as I was doing these interviews. Uh, ultimately, the I have no idea what that was. Ultimately, uh, the question that I got to was, what do workers need that work in this field? So as a result of some of this work, I developed a relationship with Stephanie Black and did work with the AIC in two particular focus groups around this content. And I can't see the clock on my computer, so I want to get my phone out. Um, we looked at or interviewed or had a, had sessions, workshops with two groups, uh, one on January 17th this year, one on the 25th. We had different part participants in each group, did them at different times. I think if we're looking at that any in any qualitative way, what's important to note is we're going to get different people in each group, people that have potentially different careers or expressions of their careers within collection. And I just want to show you briefly uh, some of the things that were mentioned in these groups that give cause for, I think, some profound attention to mental health care in the industry. So in conservators in general, there was this um, idea of being judged by others, especially because the field is tightly knit and not super large. Um, we have various and enduring levels of high responsibility, uh, people in leadership roles that are not conservators, and so then therefore don't particularly understand the task of what it means to conserve, um, feeling that they have little control over what is happening in the organization. Uh, this is something that came up in almost all of the interviews that I did related to mass trauma and that has particular emotional valence as one could suspect. 
Uh, and the idea of moving frequently because of uh, lack of jobs and this last um, a distressing lack of the institution to address um, what it means to conserve, what the ethical questions are, what the political ramifications are. In the second group, there was the mention of this earning little or not sufficient money the idea of witnessing hierarchy in the field and that being somewhat effective. And when I say effective, I mean it, it's, it's a physiologically some kind of trigger. Uh, the idea of needing skills beyond conservation, especially for those in leadership positions, uh, but also this was voiced as a personal need in terms of um, being able to navigate the multiple responsibilities that are required of conservators, especially I would say within smaller venues where you're doing more than just conserving material. Uh, a desire to be recognized and that is it. So I go to the next slide. Um, further observations. So after doing these workshops, I basically, uh, with the group of us who did the um, some of the in, some of the workshops and also subsequent interviews, I gave a lot of thought to what I thought the dynamic was that was happening within the groups. And I really this, I think, slide kind of encapsulates what I think is one of the dominant tensions within the field. Uh, as a as an assessor, as somebody who has some training and and clinical treatment for trauma, and so uh, I, I could be a licensed therapist, but I'm not in in individual practice. Assessing the field, what I saw was high performers who are asked to be simultaneously high performing in three specific areas: the cognitive, so doing high level executive functioning, which means that you're thinking deeply pretty much all of the time, doing that in a way that's effective. So there's some emotional valence to the job itself and anything in my opinion, that's gonna affect other human lives. So these are human artifacts. I, I don't know in your field what the uh, percentage is, which they're people, people's belongings, but that certainly fix, fits within a framework of thinking about what you're doing is going to be emotional. So it's going to be effective. It's going to have some kind of emotional cost. And at the same time, you're being asked to perform at a very high level cognitively. Now, a distinction in your field from other museum fields, in my opinion, is the fact that there's also this need to be scientific. So the perfectionism comes into play, the need for everything to be done exactly correctly, the, the need for you to balance between this qualitative and quantitative life. And I, I think that that by itself is demanding and worthy of attention. So um, and I'm moving these little pictures around. One of the things that I would diagnose in relationship to thinking about this is what would be called um, ethical fatigue. And I won't go through every bullet point on this slide, uh, primarily because we, are, we have a short time frame, but it's here for you to take a look at. What I would stress about ethical fatigue um, is that it's a real thing and that it has to do with feeling um, burnt out perhaps is a word people use, even though that has its own diagnosis, but really depleted from this necessity to make decisions that you feel personally responsible for and have some kind of effect on your personal ethics, but which may or may not meet the needs or the desires or the demands of the institution. So the institution says, this is what we're doing. And your feeling is this is not the right choice. And it's not the right, the choice for this preservation method. It's not the right choice for these people that are dealing with this particular artifact. Whatever it is, there's some kind of clash between what you feel is personally significant or right, ethically right, or even morally right in some cases, I suspect, uh, and, and what an institution is making demands about. The second um, slide related to this uh, diagnosis is thinking about 
fear, imposter syndrome, and perfectionism. And I mentioned um, the perfectionism earlier related to this scientific dimension of your work. I also think, you know, in a small environment where jobs are scarce, where people are being asked to wear many hats while navigating highly personal content and which may or may not be connected to trauma and in any way that a high stimulus of fear, whether it's fear, fear of failure, a fear of not doing something correct, which would be perfectionism, or this fear of uh, maybe I maybe I can't take all this on, I'm not really good enough to do this, are, are just natural results. Now, the extent to which that fear gets kind of hooked into someone's past history or messaging is not something I can assess from an objective viewpoint, but I definitely think that it happens. And so this is what will be this kind of the fear that motivates imposter syndrome and perfectionism uh, when it's underlying in any kind of job performance that's cognitive, uh, highly cognitive and highly scientific, there's or either or, there's no way for that not to be fatiguing. And that's n there's no way for that not to need address regardless of someone's personal psychology. Uh, it's it's going to be tiring because it's a lot of work to deal with fear. So um, I also thought this was very interesting related to the field was the fact that a lot of this work is really done in isolation. So you may have a team, but but the majority, like when I write as an academic, the majority of the work is done um, in by yourself. So what that will undercut is a sense of belonging. I think that heightens cultures of competitiveness and it's gonna challenge uh, identity. Also shame, which is a whole nother conversation and potentially lead to somatic symptoms, which are physiological and mental health struggles. I wanted, I put this slide in here and and maybe what I'll do is, is, is uh, wrap up my speaking, but show you the other two slides. And if Robin can make these available, I'm happy to share the um, presentation. Uh, this is These are some of the strengths that I really jumped out at me related to working with the AIC is that people in this field are capable of being super creative, of handling work that intersects with lots of different disciplines, which I will tell you in my experience of both teaching and research, is not an easy thing for people to do at all. And it was impressive to me. Uh, they're highly self-aware, especially everybody that we talk to understand the dimension of what's happening to them. Um, I think that's that gives fodder for an industry who wants to address uh, mental health. I think it's it'll be easier and, and super helpful. Um, that people are attached to this idea of building a community, um, that they're articulate and also uh, very strong-minded. So I made some recommendations. Um, I will, I, I'll just show you these slides um, and mention the left-hand column without going into it. Uh, I think building community is critical. Uh, I think there's the potential to offer workshops where people are kind of expanding skills, but then also sharing their experiences. Um, and then I articulate some additional options. I'm happy to answer some questions for you all after, and thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, yeah, this was, and I should have added too that this session or today's webinar was basically an offshoot from a session that happened at the AIC conference in Salt Lake. Um, with that one, they were really looking at the conservation community and they're kind of, the group's deciding to kind of widen the scope and looking at general state of mental health care when it comes to collections community. Okay. So, um, because we're all kind of dealing with the same issues right now when it comes to, um, just how we feel about our field and stuff. So that's kind of to put a little bit more of a placeholder on it. And I'll also add that, yes, we have made all the slides available on our website, which I'll put okay, the great. link in, in the chat here in a second. So now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Her name is Stephanie Black. She's a conservator at the Anchorage Museum, and she's also chair of the AIC Health and Safety Network. And she's going to show a little bit more about just kind of what went into um, kind of building out this program and the questionnaire when it first started. So Stephanie, feel free to take over.
Sorry, my screen did that thing where it went somewhere else. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, and thank you for that introduction, Robin. Um, hopefully, everyone can see my screen. Uh, we're going to be talking about the state of mental health for workers at the cultural heritage institutions. And I've been doing this work uh, both with Dr. Arell, who's been very gracious in giving her time and working with us, and we really appreciate this. And also with uh, Kareth Pock. Strager and Sue Casello, and also previously um, Adrian Dendron, who um, is currently uh, isn't quite with the group anymore. So I, we're kind of doing a comparison study based off of the larger survey that we sent out um, back in the spring of this year uh, to with the survey that we sent out to persist as participants. Um, a few disclaimers. These are all initial findings. This is a very sensitive subject and we will not be presenting anything that would be identifying and all information that would be identifying will remain confidential. And so we're gonna go through and just talk about what we, why we kind of pursued this area. Um, I really wanna state that we're all volunteers that are doing this work. And um, so it's gonna be a slow process, but we wanted to put together data that people can actually use and is accessible. So that is one of our future goals. And so it's to make this information available to everybody so that they can present this information and also kind of to make sure that we don't feel alone in this effort. Um, we really wanted to see what was happening in our own conservation practices. A lot of times we're discussing things internally. Um, <clears throat> And it's uh, it's kind of always maybe been like stories that we share between each other, um, but not so much uh, in a wider space. And to start advocating as well um, in this wider sector, determine what resources are possible for conservators. And this really kind of became, it's always kind of been something that the Health and Safety Network wanted to look at, but it just, it, we couldn't get it off the ground. And then, you know, we're volunteers. Um, time and people um, positions switch over. And, you know, it's becoming more prevalent that a lot of industries are looking more into the mental health of their workers because they're seeing an impact on their bottom line. Um, and also the pandemic, I think, really put a spotlight on it in a huge global scale. Uh, through Kareth, we were able to partner with Dr. Rell, and she's been high upping us in determining our objectives. Uh, we set up the focus groups with her that she led, and they, we also did some trial surveys uh, with those focus group participants. We just did this wider survey that we sent out in the spring based on that feedback, and our next plan is to start adjusting that survey again to make it just more inclusive of the wider cultural heritage um, audience. So the results that we got um, from the survey, we sent out to 290, 2,993 AAC members. We got a response of about 438, around 440, with a 14.6 response rate. And we, we're seeing similar demographics to what we were seeing in other surveys that have gone out. We had 52 people attend our um, um, the luncheon, which was amazing. And it led to some really great um, conversations out in Salt Lake about you know, what people were thinking and feeling. And um, we have quite a few future plans. Uh, we do want to modify the survey to make it more broad um, for more of the cultural heritage sector. Um, we want to do statistical analysis of the survey results that um, would probably require to get a grant and funding for someone to kind of look through the data. And then we want to make it easily accessible. We're planning right now to put, um, some of these graphs and tables up on the Health and Safety Network's wiki page, and we can get that link to everybody um, if, if you want it. Um, we wanna do more engagement and outreach activities and also to just see what can be developed or explored that's more specific to the cultural heritage sector in terms of addressing our mental health concerns. So um, we got 76 respondents. Um, to uh, our questionnaire that we sent out in the survey. And this is kind of gives us a general idea of who um, hopefully is attending today. See, we have a lot of people from collections management and conservation as well as other areas. 
And it's really exciting. And I would like to thank the participants who did respond to the survey. It's really appreciated. Um, and so kind of what we're going forward here is we're comparing between the conservator survey that we sent out and the survey that the participants did. And so you will see that people from this, uh, the webinar survey will be on the right hand with the conservation survey on the left hand. And that will be in blue. And then the webinar series will be in red. And all of these slides again will be made available. So you can see that we have, do you think your experience in mental health effects related to your cultural heritage work? And we do see a lot of similarities. You see kind of both the even between the, um, the positive and the negative. And we had, the reason why this is also kind of a bit slow is we've had also a lot of comments in the survey and we had about 78. Um, who kind of gave more in-depth things and that's what we're hoping to do with the wider survey that we plan to send out to um to a wider uh, cultural heritage sector um we also have uh this these slides that are you can kind of see i think a lot of times when we think about how much work and effort that we're putting into it you know it's is it is it the same? Well, are we being compensated at the same rate? And I feel like people do kind of feel like we are in this area where it's about the same amount, but also just a little bit higher as well. Um, and then we have, again, do you think that our organi professional organizations be, should be, you know, advocating for this? And this could take a bunch of different forms. There was also a lot of written in response in the conservation survey. Um, in the next thing, when we did the survey, we talked or we asked about funding as well, and we had uh, quite an interesting response to that. Um, a lot less people felt that we should be funding it through the American Institute of Conservation, and but they definitely wanted to see more advocacy for it. And then we had about 54 written responses on the funding thing. And these are the things that we're currently trying to go through and it does take quite a long time to kind of determine what those comments or written responses mean, but you do see that there definitely does need to be some sort of awareness coming from our professional organizations. And so how would you rate the level of stress that you experience in your role? It's um, on the higher side. And yeah, it's gonna be a lot of um, comparing of charts. Um, has the topic of mental health come up in any professional networks, forums, or organizations that you're involved in? Um, less so for the conservators, but also it was much higher when you see for the participants um, for this webinar. Um, for people, when it came, the topic came up, the majority said they only talked about it kind of at that intercolleague level, not really on the broader one, and also mostly in response um, to emergency response training. Um, definitely, again, that COVID brought up the mental health issues a lot more and that um, people were a lot more aware of it during COVID. And uh, people either, they were kind of more with the work and participating in the focus groups. You were seeing this kind of more kind of intimate discussion as opposed to like, are we talking to HR? Are we talking to the higher ups in the hierarchy? With um, if they were seeing it in any other other workplaces, um, are you aware of any of your colleagues or other professional peers that have expressed mental health concerns uh, in their place? Of work, you said yes, that was pretty high for both groups and about the same percentages. Um, the other thing that we found from the focus groups was this idea of our identities being tied to our, um, our careers. And we're seeing that as well in the same vein for um, the wider cultural heritage field of the people who participated. Um, this was another interesting thing that kind of came up um, from the focus groups as well, based on your experiences working in cultural heritage field, would you recommend this career to others? And it's kind of interesting to see that it's in more in the middle, but you know, that people you know, these do feel strongly about it. And this is another part of the trend that we were seeing is that um, people really do like, we do like what we do as professions. 
professionals, we do like working with cultural heritage and it is important to us. And so again, this is kind of in the same vein with the cultural heritage field could benefit from addressing career influence, mental health, similar to like we do physical health risks. Uh, everyone pretty much strongly agrees. And we see also that if considering like leaving a position um, based off of um, the workplace factors impacting it, you do see surprisingly for me, it was quite a lot more than I thought it would be. Um, but the number one reason why people that wrote in was they kind of um, stuck it out because they were on short-term contracts. Um, and then other popular answers were just, they didn't want gaps in the resume or they were able to get therapy. Um, other reasons why people, you know, they hadn't left, uh, they wouldn't be able to find a comparable position, maybe where they were living, um, they can't afford to find a new job, or in some cases they were actually able to um, have their situation improved. So here we have, you know, have you considered leaving it due to your area of specialization? We really, really love what we do. I love what I do. I know everyone that I work with loves what they do. They really care. We're very passionate. And I think a lot of times the work itself, what we're working with, we derive positive aspects to mental health. Um, but a lot of times it came more down to, you know, we've invested a lot of time and energy and money into our careers. Um, it takes a long time to get training in conservation. I'm sure, and, and I know it's the same for other parts of the cultural heritage sector and other jobs. It's just, it's a lot of time to feel like you've kind of made it to a point where you feel stable um, or, you know, you couldn't afford to start over in a new career or you're very emotionally, it would you couldn't sink the emotional cost into it either. Uh, and, you know, our identities, we do feel tied to this. So this is kind of where it tends to change over is when we're talking about the work environment. Um, we, for, the, uh, for the conservation survey, we saw a double in the number of people wanting to leave the field due to the work environment versus the actual conservation work. Um, kind of seeing a little bit of um, similarity there as well. Uh, but a lot of it does seem to have more to do with, you know, maybe the institution or the department that you're working in more so than it is the actual work that we're doing on the ground or our specializations. So improving your workplace conditions, of course, would improve our mental health. And I think everyone pretty strongly agreed with that. Um, we saw that very similarity, very clear between both surveys. Um, again, a lot of similarities. We do tend to feel often or occasionally overwhelmed with um, our work. Uh, we are often, I think, are occasionally asked to take on additional responsibilities from what is related to our roles. And we feel, you know, like we do feel pretty positive often and occasionally. Um, it's great to see that some people are constantly feeling positive. That's awesome. Um, and then we do see a lot of negative effects as well. Um, the negative influences and often and occasionally seem to be the same across the board. So we also kind of asked about stressors. Um, there's a lot of similarities between what, you know, what the type of negative influences are that affect all these different points. And these are the things that several different industries are looking at because they're seeing it impact their employees' work output as well. And it does impact everybody. I was um, happy to see that we're not doing too many things with substance abuse, uh, but it is, it is interesting that a lot of these numbers have come out the same, which shows that, again, what we were kind of thinking that we are all in this together. Um, and again, about anxiety, still high with the often and occasionally. And we asked this question also to kind of give some information to um, Holly and Mark's project as well. Um, we do see people that are occasionally working with it and um, less so than constantly. 
And so also the pandemic question kind of, we got a lot of different responses. The biggest one was berries or negative. Um, it was interesting to see the difference in terms of positivity for the AIC member survey versus the this the the uh, you guys who participated in the survey for this webinar. Um, we did get a lot of comments on this one. Um, we saw positive influence from hybrid work, also being able to do some work from home, and then more of that recognition of the mental health and the workplace issues. But a lot of a negative influence from uncertainty, impact, impact on job security, um, healthcare coverage, stress, isolation, and training, just you know, feeling kind of more alone in different areas. And I think it went back and forth for a lot of people. Um, and then we asked this question. Um, the biggest thing we're seeing is compassion and empathy fatigue, but also burnout. And that I think correlates very well with other industries that are seeing a lot of burnout in their employees. Um, and it's not specifically unique to us, but it is something we definitely need to be addressing. Um, going forward on. So we have, this is, um, these last few slides are more related to, are related to the AIC survey results um, and kind of talking about other stressors that, you know, are more, more universally uh, problematic, like micromanagement, saw a large percentage of that. Staff turno turnover and shortages can also be pretty difficult to deal with, as well as you know microaggressions. A lot of uncompensated overtime. Um, sometimes you know, like needing that secondary support or familial support, and then mismanagement between individual versus institutional professional values. And what we also saw with um, we in this longer survey that we did, which we are planning to do as well as to send out a longer survey to um, the wider sector, we kind of talked about more about you know scen scenarios within the conservation workplace that affected mental health, and you had like outreach and collaboration with un underrepresented groups and oppressed communities, or managing large scale projects that had more positive effects, but the negative effects really seem to be the same across um, different parts of the sector. And you had this, you know, and kind of the next steps really were, have you reported any of these health concerns to your superiors? Um, you know, 40% said yes, more said no. A lot of it did come down to that fear of retaliation or fear of being labeled, concern about job security again. and just you know like did you really feel like you could go to hr and then we also have kind of this breakdown of the coping mechanisms that people are doing so for robin if you wanted to do the poll we have um kind of asking the same type of questions about what kind of um coping mechanisms that you guys uh are also working with and so we'll give you some time to do that um a lot of times, I think what we found from the survey that we did, that people really were kind of depending on their relationships and um, to get that kind of support that they needed. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and go on to resources page. So this is um, the mental health and emergency response resource pages. Um, this will also be made available um, and it's already available online. And another list that we have as well, if you wanted to scan for QR codes. And that is the end. I'd like to thank Dr. Arell, um, Carmina, Lamar Bertard, Mark Wilson, and Holly Kisick McVeigh, our focus group participants, and all of the survey participants from both sections. I've also really enjoyed working with Sue Costello and Kareth Karshager, and also Adrian Gendron on this project. And thank you all very much for attending. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so I'm going to leave the poll up for a little bit. There are three questions on it, just so everyone knows. So please do feel free to complete those as we go. And then maybe during the Q&A period, we can go through some of the answers, but I do want to keep the program mm -hmm. um, moving for now. So feel free to stop sharing your screen whenever you're ready. And we'll go ahead and introduce our final two speakers who are going to talk about stress and psychological trauma in museum workers. 
Uh, we have Dr. Holly Cusack McVeigh, who's Associate Professor of Anthropology and Museum Studies, also a public scholar of collections and community curation, Associate Professor of Native American and Indigenous Studies at the Indiana University of Indianapolis, and Dr. Mark Wilson, Clinical Assistant Professor, Occupational and Environmental Health Sciences, Biomedical Health Sciences at Purdue University. Uh, Dr. Holly and Dr. Mark, please feel free to take over and start whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Holly Cusack McVeigh. Um, my research centered in social justice focuses on cultural heritage, collections, repatriation, and toxic heritage. I've worked in the museum and cultural heritage fields for decades, supporting museums and also Native American and indigenous communities throughout the world. Hello, my name is Mark Wilson. I serve as faculty lead for the Biomedical Health Sciences Program within the Purdue University School of Health Sciences. My previous research investigated the impact of work-related stress on cardiovascular function. My current research interests include psychosocial and ergonomic factors of the workplace. I have experience in health and safety management and teach courses in occupational and environmental health sciences. Our collaboration began as a result of our membership in the American Industrial Hygiene Association's Museum and Cultural Heritage Industry Working Group. Our group's mission is to create a forum that brings together occupational health and safety professionals with conservation and collection care professionals in order to effectively address risk management needs by sharing combined knowledge and existing practices. This study is funded by a pilot project training grant from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and known as NIOSH, uh, administered through the University of Michigan Center for Occupational Health and Safety Engineering. The study was approved by the Purdue University Institutional Review Board and through an IRB reliance agreement with Indiana University. Our study and our survey tool were designed in partnership with our valued colleagues listed here. Our study titled Stress and Psychological Trauma in Museum Workers aims to better understand the ways that museum staff and those in the cultural heritage field are impacted by the emotional stress of managing cultural collections, managing um, actually more than cultural collections, um, all collections, um, and also exhibitions that evoke trauma. This study is important because this trauma is often underestimated and or dismissed altogether by employers in the museum world, as well as the public. Museums throughout our country tell difficult stories as a part of their mission. The Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, pictured here, for example, interprets the painful truths of America's history of racial injustice. The museum staff at the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. have grappled with the care and display of one such traumatic object. The casket of Emmett Till, a young African American boy who was lynched in Mississippi in 1955. At the 9-11 Memorial Museum in New York City, objects of trauma are carefully curated to tell difficult histories. We cast a wide net ensuring that our, we were outreaching to not only large institutions, but also small to mid-sized museums. Committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we wanted to ensure that we were reaching a broad and diverse audience when circulating our survey invitation. Those went out via email, regional and national newsletters, conference programs, as well as purchased ads in professional journals. 
And most recently, we purchased an ad for the upcoming Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums and their national conference, which takes place next month in November. Our study was widely distributed among numerous professional societies. Modifications were made to the invitation flyer as we purchased advertising from organizations, including, but not limited to, uh, the Alliance of American Museums, known as AAM, the Association of Midwest Museums, and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. The study is still open and we invite participation through the end of 2024. Our initial study proposal focused mainly on conservators, curators, archivists, and librarians. The grant reviewers for the study commented that library workers may have little to no exposure to traumatic material. Knowing that librarians routinely work with sensitive documents, including records of violent crimes, obituaries, and other public records that result in traumatic exposures, we chose to retain that category. The reviewers also suggested that we include a wider range of museum roles in our study population. Uh, we added additional job titles uh, to this survey to include security guards, maintenance workers, development staff, and administrators. To date, uh, museum educators comprise the largest single group of respondents uh, in the study, uh, followed by curators. Many of the study participants did not self-identify with, with any single job title that we listed on the questionnaire, but instead selected the category of other. And some examples of those other job titles included zookeeper, guest services, evaluator, park ranger interpreter, NAGRA, NAGPRA specialist, and oral historian. We've received survey responses thus far from approximately 500 museum workers throughout the United States. We are receiving responses from a broad range of institutions from small local community museums to large government and university museums. We use the NIOSH definition of job stress in our study uh, to assess uh, one of our primary outcomes uh, for this particular study. Uh, participants rated their level of job stress on an 11 point scale ranging from a no stress to a lot of stress. We consolidated the results of, of, the, of the preliminary data uh, into four categories. Uh, the no stress category uh, corresponds to a value of zero uh, on that job stress scale. And only about 1% of the participants reported uh, having no stress uh, in, their, in their job. The vast majority of participants reported having a moderate to high level of stress which corresponds to a value of ranging from five to nine on that 11 point scale. Over 10% of participants reported the highest level of stress, which we categorized here as, as maximal stress, which is a 10 out of 10 on the stress scale. Preliminary findings suggest that workers in the museum and cultural heritage fields are greatly impacted by the nature of their work activities, but they do not see themselves as understood and supported by their institutions. Survey respondents self-reported feelings of depression and fatigue by work activities that regularly expose them to trauma-related collections and exhibitions. These reported museum work activities are diverse and broad in nature, but to date they include working with human remains, recording and listening to oral histories, working with and caring for 
tangible items that belong to victims and interpreting these difficult stories. The situations which were considered to be the most emotionally disturbing for, this, for the respondents are viewing images of human suffering, reading accounts of individuals who have been victims of crime or discrimination, and handling of human remains. We hope this study will raise awareness of these issues and result in resources that help museum workers address trauma and better manage the, job, the related job stress. Here are some resources about job-related stress and working with traumatic material. And we'll be sure to put those in the chat, the link as well. We'd like to thank uh, Dr. Adam Finkel from the University of Michigan for administering the grant to fund our study and Robin uh, Byer Kilgore for, Kilgore for providing the opportunity to share the study with the audience. Great, thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing that, all of you for sharing those resources and everything. Um, I think what we can do right now is I did end the poll. So if you guys want to, we can share that real quick and then maybe take a couple questions and have some open discussion. So Stephanie, I don't know if you wanna read through kind of the results that we got yep. or what. Yeah, so for question one, which of the following methods do you currently use to deal with mental health issues related to your workplace or practice? Um, the number one was relationships. Um, the second one was behavioral we also had about physical and emotional were the same. Um, and then workplace changes uh, came towards uh, in uh, fifth and then chemical in sixth. And for uh, the second one, the second question, would you participate in a focus group? We had about 60% of um, 80 responses. People would say yes and 40% said no. And are you currently experiencing stress related to disaster or emergency response scenarios in your area? We do have 13% who said yes, um, but the majority did say no. So thank you guys for um, asking, uh, for doing our poll. Yeah, it's interesting right now. Well, there's a couple things and I, I do encourage our audience to put some questions in the Q&A box if they have one. I know uh, Dr. Arell, you answered someone's question earlier in the chat. So thank you for doing that. Um, but if anyone else has questions, please put them in the Q&A box so we can track them. Um, I was struck by just the correlations between our communities. <laughs> like, it's just nice to see it because I know sometimes, like, at least in my experience, it feels like we can silo ourselves slightly into what the conservators are doing and what the general collections management is doing, you know, that kind of world, because I am a registrar by training. And it was kind of interesting to see how alike we felt in many ways. I don't know if anyone has any more comments on that or Stephanie Black, your experience with that. I I, I did have a feeling, but I think it's just the way that our, um, our sector is kind of set up. You know, we're all kind of individuals. We're all kind of doing our work. We all kind of get very pulled up into what we're doing, but at the same time, we're all experiencing the same, you know, similar issues. And I think th there's power in numbers um, and that's kind of why we're putting this together um, is, you know, to be able to show like if there are issues, give those percentages so that people can maybe take that to HR or to their higher ups and be like, look, you know, this is this is uh, something that is common across our sector. We're seeing it for all different groups of people, all different professions within the cultural heritage sector. And maybe that might push for a difference since we know that everyone in the higher up kind of prefers data and they prefer statistics and information. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of, you know, part of why we're doing this. And, you know, like, you know, just to make things better for all of us is kind of the bigger goal. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's interesting kind of what you guys, refer, everyone kind of referred to is I think um, the, the, the prime COVID years, because I still maintain that COVID still happens. Um, but the big years when everything was really shut down and the world kind of felt like it was really changing, people acknowledged it a lot more, just the mental health issues and especially all of a sudden being in your house all the time and, uh, you know, doing all that. And 
it feels like it has lessened a little bit as the world has reopened and stuff. But I, I do hope that we're seeing a shift for places who, who we work for, museums, nonprofits, all those are acknowledging. You know what I mean? The fact that this is such an important part of what we have to do. Um, oh, we got some questions coming in. So I definitely want to take a look at them. Um, it says, what, our first question is for any panelists. What is your outlook given this knowledge and seeing these trends for new professionals in the field? What can be done to prepare emerging cultural professionals for those stressful environments? That is a super good question because I know as someone who's been in this field for 20 years, I always get a lot of like, can you talk to this young student about this, this field? And I'm always like, uh, <laughs> like you're in for a roller coaster. But what kind of what would what kind of experiences or what would you guys say to that? Um, so I, I um oh I can go ahead or do you want to go first, Holly? Oh, okay. Um, we've had uh, high school students come in here, and I am just very blunt about what's going on, but also, you know, what's being improved as well. And I think the fact that there is just a lot more awareness about mental health and about, okay, the issues that we're having with maybe salary, pay, location, I'm just kind of like, these are the things. And, you know, I'm optimistic that these things will improve, um, but I'm also just very clear about you know what it takes um and i try to be you know just I, I want people to have all the information and then they can make the decision from there and i would just say following what stephanie has said what mark and i hope comes from this study is first raising awareness and secondly what tools can we provide particularly to small to mid-sized museums um, to better address these um, these mental health um, issues related to trauma in the work that they do. I also think that museum studies programs, um, and I speak for that sector rather than how we train conservators, but across the board, I think we need to be training professionals going into the museum field and the cultural heritage field um, and, and better incorporate health and safety um, as, as, a, as a larger uh, emphasis in the curriculum. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that because that is one thing when I first started working with conservators, because um, again, as a trained registrar, it was when I first kind of introduced to the world of conservation and they were all like all these things about wearing masks and being very particular of, of just health and safety issues and all that. And I'll be honest, during my registrar training, I, in any of that like it was be careful about taxidermy and arsenic and stuff like that but I didn't have any of that formalized training and I've always been very jealous of that so wholeheartedly agree um and someone did ask has have there have you seen work being done to include some of the types of information and instruction in museum study programs so thank you for including that Holly for sure um, someone has asked, please discuss the cumulative effect of multiple traumatic events. What are some tools, suggestions that we can bring to our organizations to help our teams? Um, yeah, like, especially for those who maybe work in areas, I'm going to really highlight where I used to live, the Southeast, where, you know, obviously Hurricane Alley in Florida and what they're dealing with in North Carolina. Do you guys have any recommendations for areas that may have dealt with, you know, repetitive events or, just kind of an overall cumulative effects of anything? Can anyone recommend anything? Um, I'll say first, uh, to, to, to loop into the last question too, to say that um, part of what a psychological kind of preparation for taking a job where you're encountering anything that has to do with mental health has to do with the raising awareness and the purpose of the awareness is not just here's what happens. The, one of the most like jarring things that people can ex experience, which will exacerbate negative mental health effects has to do with things happening that you didn't expect, right? So if you even loop that into the question about these natural disasters, um, one thing after another, I mean, the, the storm in Tampa that they just had, so, the fact that they had one storm they expected and the next one right after that, that by itself is going to exacerbate traumatic symptomatology. So part of why I'm looping those two together is just to illustrate the example that when you understand this is going to be the nature of what I'm going to experience, then you're capable of having, um, of receiving and understanding skills at a greater rate. 
you will be able to process them easier. Now this gets into the meat of this question, which is the, the most important thing is to regulate your body. And whatever that has to do with, with these, with these multiple, um, multiple and cumulative effects is that what happens is each of each event will hook in somatically to the event before it. And so whatever, even if the fourth event is way less potent than the second one, you're probably going to react more explosively to event number four than the one that was way worse, event number two. So what has to continually happen to manage this is to figure out some kind of patterning where the body itself actually has some kind of homeostasis. And, and if that doesn't get accessed, then the ability to continue to navigate will just continually be um, uh, disrupted, I guess, is one, one particular word. Uh, so I think thinking about ways in which people can regulate themselves and whatever that I means there we see lots of um articles that are being put up here there's going to be um methods of regulation within any of these and there's many many different ones that it's important to find a way to pattern yourself into regulation thank you yeah that's it's huge and thank you for you know giving that idea out to the area or out to the community and for that question as well well, it is 201 Eastern, so I do need to wrap up today's program. Um, I'm going to go ahead and send out a copy of the chat transcript and the questions to our panelists. Um, I would also encourage you all to reach out to me at c2cc at culturalheritage.org if you have any other questions for our panelists, and I'll make sure to get them to them. Um, I'm very excited to see what kind of results you guys get from the continued survey and everything. Um, this is a little different than our usual C2C care webinar. Usually we try to really focus on, you know, care of an object or an item type, but I think that this isn't a huge part of what we do. Um, we had done a C2C care webinar over a year ago about people dealing with traumatic collections, right? We talked about the Emmett Till kit, casket and a couple other things, but I think um, this is a section of our webinar or our world that is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. And I appreciate you guys fighting the good fight and continuing to talk to our uh, community about these issues. So thank you all very much. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up today's program. Um, please join us next month. I want to go ahead and again, thank our speakers, IMLS for supporting our program, FAIC. Uh, the recording should be up in just a few days. So keep an eye on our website. Um, everyone stay safe and healthy. And we will see you all in just a few weeks for our next two webinars in November. So thanks again to our speakers and we'll see you all soon.